why is alcohol uh, so bad for you? I mean, so many people just drink and drink. Everybody feels like, like they got to have a drink before they go to bed. Everybody it feels like they got to have a drink to wind down. They have to have a drink to have fun. They have to have a drink. Everybody's got to have a drink. How, maybe from a scientific standpoint, how bad is alcohol when you're talking about longevity and living a, because this, this is my thought. This is why I'm asking this is because I think in my mind, and I'm not, I'm not against drinking. I, I drink wine. I'll have a cocktail every now and then. But the, the, the thing I think about is the way it makes me feel, my, the way my body feels afterward, it doesn't feel good. It feels very dehydrated. It doesn't feel like a normal day for me. I don't like it, uh, the, you know, that after feeling. But, but I also think in my mind, I, I think about those people in the future that are just so sick and they're so, you know, overweight, you know, they, they're, they're always drinking beer all the time and they're so overweight and they look so sickly to me and they look so unhealthy. And, it, and to me, it's sad. It's sad because not only are they killing themselves, but now the people around them, like I would never want my kids to have to see me like that. I, I'm, you know, one of the reasons why I've always tried to, to maintain uh, a healthy lifestyle is because I wanted to be that dad. I have two kids. I wanted to be that dad that was playing with my kids, was, you know, kicking the soccer ball and out in the backyard and running around and, 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 you know, going to all their games and doing all kinds of fun stuff. I, you know, I'd take them out of school and we would go to the carnival and I would get in the ride with them. And I always thought, man, I never wanted to be that dad that couldn't fit into the ride. Right. And so I, 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 I purposely thought about that kind of stuff because I, I'm, I'm with you, man. I, I want to live, you know, I want to like do things and enjoy life versus just sitting there. So maybe just, can you touch on the, the effects of alcohol? Yeah, it's a really great question. And there's, I think a couple, I'm going to address it from a couple of different ways. So one society has made this so normal in our life. Um, the world has said like, you have to drink in order to have fun. You have to drink in order to relax. You have to drink in order to uh, be at a, at a social setting, at a sports game, at a party, whatever it might be. And again, I'm not a prude when it comes to drinking. Um, I partake uh, as um, in an inconsistent way, I would say. That's the one thing that I'm not consistent at, um, whether it be a glass of wine um, during date night once a week or uh, whether it be once a month going and um, enjoying a nice, a nice afternoon on a boat um, and having a couple beverages. But when you... When you can dissociate from that, people go into people start drinking because they're a not secure with themselves. They don't they they have to drink in order to change their reality, alter their reality, so that they can feel better in whatever scenario they are. Which comes back to the mind, their thoughts, their beliefs, their emotions that they haven't been able to take captive yet. They haven't been able to take ownership of them, and so they have to mask it somehow. Second is. Uh, to calm down at night, you you mentioned this one as well. They're, they they haven't figured out that meditation, breath work, uh, journaling, reflection time, reading can all alleviate a lot of this anxiety that they're feeling, and it doesn't need a substance to do that. Now, let's go into like the impact side of it. Alcohol at its core is basically poison within the body. Um, if you talk about something, a metric that people may or may not be familiar of is heart rate variability. So heart rate variability, otherwise known as HRV, is measuring the time increments or the time intervals in between your successive heartbeats. And if I was to say your resting heart rate is 60 beats per minute, we would say 60 beats divided by 60 seconds is one beat per second. That's how many times it's beating. Well, that's not how our body functions. And what actually happens is we, uh, our heart only beats when it has to. So the more relaxed we are, the less quote unquote stressed we are or stressors that our body's having to adapt to, it's more loosey goosey. So it might be 798 milliseconds, 895 milliseconds, 942. So a lot of variance, a high level of variance, meaning your HRV will be high. Conversely, when stress starts to take on, such as low sleep time, um, high amounts of exercise, 
uh, you're in a fight with your spouse, you've got a lot of business stress going on, you've got anxiety, our heart goes, oh my gosh, Daniel's about to die. We have to protect him. We need to start regulating his heartbeat. And so it might be 805 milliseconds, 810 milliseconds, 895 milliseconds, 887 milliseconds, and regulate it out more, plummeting the variability of those successive beats. And if you measure it after a night of drinking, after something as simple as one beverage, your HRV will drop about 25%. To a, with it now, and, and that's for me. And that's having like one drink occasionally once every couple of weeks. You have somebody who goes and gets blackout drunk, they'll come and they could see a 60 to 70% decrease in HRV. And the definition of HRV is how your body's handling stress and strain that's being placed on it. So you can now start to imagine the impact internally of what's going on with your body, what it's having to fight through, what it's having to deal with, what it's having to overcome in order just to get yourself back to a state of normalcy when you're drinking either regularly or irregularly. Um, but any type of alcohol consumption is unbelievably hard on your system um, from a, uh, for, and, and now the data can show it. So if you've got a wearable device, if you've got an aura, a Fitbit, a polar, a whoop, a Garmin, an Apple, uh, look for the measure HRV, do a little experiment. Don't drink for three or four days. Look at what happens to your HRV. Have a few drinks, check it the next day. And you're going to be like, by golly, that guy was on to something. How, how do we, how do we get better sleep? Because I know you talk a lot about sleeping and the importance of sleeping um, and, and it's, again, one of those pieces of science now that's becoming more and more available to us. And, and we're starting to recognize that, you know, four hours a night is just not enough. So tell us why and maybe some ideas on how to sleep better at night. Yeah, this is this is so great. So I'll actually give the audience and the listeners two different places to go. So they can go to ownithrv.com. Um, and everything I was just talking about with heart rate variability, it'll actually explain it to you really, really well and give you a little ebook that'll actually walk you through in a couple successive videos that'll help you understand HRV and your body in a whole new different way. It'll open up a different dimension for you. And then second, if you go to ownitsleep.com, uh, I've basically put together 25 years of research, uh, extrapolated every major sleep study out there, um, and brought it down to about 15 of the best practices that can help you get a great night's sleep um, every single night. Um, Esquire actually did a feature on that um, ebook that I did. It was pretty cool. Um, and so if you go to go to that, you can get that PDF for you as well. Um, it'll just be right sent to you. But the framework that I utilize when it comes to uh, sleeping, very, very simple. It's a three, two, one rule. So three hours before bed, no more food, like no more major meals, cut it out. Why? We've got 400 times more melatonin that's produced in our gut than is actually produced by the pineal gland in our brain. So if we're taking in food, not only is it a stressor, thus increasing cortisol, but it's also pulling blood from the rest of our body that should be in our brain, washing um, and cleansing our brain at night to actually flowing it down to our cyst, to our gut to help digest the food. And so it's not going to get as much melatonin from the gut out into the body. It's not going to allow our body to get into as deep as restful states. It's going to increase cortisol. It's going to decrease our ability to get into the restorative states of sleep and thus act as a major disruptor. So three hours of before bed, no more major meals, cut that out. So if we have a consistent sleep time of like 10 to 1030, no more meals after seven to 730, like make sure you're done, make sure your dinner is a little earlier, no more snacks, like cut that out. If they're going to be a liquid, cool. Um, but cut that out two hours before bed, no more work. So no more heavy decision making. So uh, if you're that person that's sending emails right up until the moment you're going to bed, if you're texting about what the schedule looks like the next day, if you're sitting with your spouse trying to figure out uh, who's cooking dinner the following night and starting to figure out your calendar and your scheduling, 
None of these things are going to be preparing you to get a great night's sleep. Why? Again, it's going to cause an increase in cortisol, a decrease in melatonin, and thus increase the thought process and the thinking process and the anxiety me um, mechanisms within us that won't allow us to settle down and um, truly prepare to get into those deeper states of sleep. And then number three is one hour before bed, no more blue light. So for every hour of blue light exposure after sunset, it decreases melatonin release by 30 minutes. So if we're watching two hours of TV after sunset, uh, where melatonin release is going to be about one to two hours after or delayed from when it should be. So if we're going to bed at 10 o'clock, we're actually not getting our peak melatonin release till about midnight, which should have happened two hours prior. So it's going to, again, keep us out of these deep quality states of sleep. And the, th the crazy thing about it is that we've got this glymphatic system and our glymphatic system, think about it like as a car wash for our brain. And so the glymphatic system is 10 times more active at night than it is during the day, which is why when we don't get great night sleeps, we have brain fog the next day, we can't put two thoughts together. Um, we have an increase in dementia and Alzheimer's long term, we have uh, maybe a few more headaches, all because we haven't been able to eliminate the toxicity that is existing within our brain. And so that three, two, one rule is something just so simple, so easy um, to implement. Um, even before we get into like the deeper things, like what does our sleep environment look like? How do we, what temperatures do we sleep at? But if we just hit the three, two, one rule, you will notice an amazing shift and an amazing change in how you sleep, the quality of your sleep, and the state of restfulness in which you awake in the morning um, to ultimately impact you in a big, big way. If you like this video and you want to watch another one, click right here. If you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.